Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Of all the murder mysteries, the plot which most intrigues me is the locked room. And when you take that as an ingredient and add to it elements of the supernatural, both sacred and profane, then you have a tale to tantalize and terrify, such as the one I bring you now. Now look, Doctor, the law is... Excuse me. Well, hello there, Sheriff. New star looks good on you. Yeah. Seems I'm going to have a use for it right away. Oh, Abner. Ben James, my deputy, just rode in hell for leather. After the doc here left Doomdorf, seems the preacher came by, headed for Doomsdorf's place, breathing fire and carrying his gun. Looks like all hell is finally ready to break loose up there. <laughs> mystery drama, The Sealed Room Murder, was adapted from the M.D. Post story, The Doomdorf Murder, especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin, and stars Howard Da Silva and Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. violence go with a pioneer state. But the counterbalance has kept us viable as a nation, brought us to leadership around the world. Compassion, fair-mindedness, and the essential ingredient of America, a shrewd and pragmatical eye tempered by religion, has built us a keel which so far has kept our ship of state steady. So much for philosophy. As for the story... Let Judge Randolph tell us that. The pioneer was not the only man in the great mountains behind Virginia. Strange aliens drifted in after the colonial wars. Adventurers who were with Braddock and La Salle and rode out of Mexico after her many empires went to pieces. Doomdorf was one of them. I shall never forget that first day he walked into the land office. Huge black-bearded with broad, thick hands with square fingers. Even Abner's bulk seemed to diminish in front of him, and the child who followed Doomdorf diminished to a pygmy. It's the place where I buy. Should I want to, the land? Yeah, I reckon. Depends on what you want it for, Mr. Doomdorf. Angelos Doomdorf. Oh, excuse me. Uh, this is Mr. Randolph. I should say one of our foremost lawyers in town. Saving only, that's all we got right now. <laughs> one. I'm Abner Dale, county clerk. I reckon you'd term me. And uh, what would you want this land for? To live on. Uh-huh. You and your uh, um, daughter. Me and her, Yes. Well, now, I got a copy of the Washington Survey and the original Crown Grant here. I have it picked already. Show you here on survey map I got from Capitol. Now, well, let's see here. There. That's it. <laughs> Are you sure there's land you want, sir? I think what Abner means to say is this wedge of rock has never been worth even running the lines. Do you, do you know what you're getting into? Have you seen this piece of property? No. Ah. It's a forbidding pile of rock, Mr. Doomdorf, and isolated. It and is mine. I want it. Well, pretty mean up there right now with the wind and no shelter. I have tent, sleeping bag. All my life I live rough. Well, that's all very well for you, but for the little girl... What is good for me is good for her. I don't think you quite understand. 
As a lawyer, I should not like to see you taken advantage of. The parcel of land which you have bought was never surveyed because it is not worth surveying. It consists almost entirely of rock. I know what he's like. He's right for me. Well, how are you going to feed? Ain't much game running up in that part of Western Virginia. I make out all right. Here. Here is gold. Enough. <laughs> hey, look at there. Pieces of eight, ducats, English guineas, American dollars. Yeah, you're quite a traveler, Mr. Doomdorf. What I do is my business. And I mind my own business. I don't like anyone who'll stick his nose in my affairs. You take the money and give me the paper so I can go. Uh, no offense, just trying to be friendly. That's uh, Angelus. A N G E L U S. All right. Yeah. Well, Want to spell your other name? I don't know. You right. You tell me. D O O M D O R F. That look right? Yeah, we we'll do. It's coming on the winter, sir. If there's any way we can help you build your house... I but... build myself. With enough gold, anything can be done. You will see. Are you finished that paper, senor? Oh, yeah. I reckon. Uh, you sign right here, and me and Mr. Randolph will witness it. Here? Yeah, right. I make my heart. <laughs> that is legal. No. Miss Randolph? His mark? Yeah, I think we can witness that, Abner. Let us not delay Mr. Doomdorf and his daughter further. I'll add my John Hancock to that. There you are. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Your deed of possession to what we call the Devil's Hump. And uh, welcome to our community. Do not count me a part of it. I live to myself. Come, you. <laughs> well, if that don't beat all. A hard man. Evil man. One who's done a lot of living. Notice the scars? Yeah. I wager he has bullet ones underneath his shirt to go with the knife tracks. <laughs> I sure wish he hadn't chosen our neck of the woods to hide out in. Hide out? What else would you figure? The devil's hump is no place for a man to make his home. That's a place for a man to set his back against the wall to fight off what he knows is coming after him. I suppose you're right, Abner. The more's the pity. Why? Oh, that... that innocent child should be dragged along to share such an exile. Yeah. You get a real close look at her. What was she? Dumb that she couldn't speak? I doubt it. Afraid. And now you got it. Afraid and beaten. Well, I pity her. That's a hard man. Uh, for all... For all he seeks solitude, I doubt he'll find it. We have not seen the end of Mr. Doomdorf. Only the beginning. I'll stake my life on it. But it was not my life that was to be staked, but others. For a while, my uneasy feelings seemed just to be based on a negative reaction to Doomdorf himself... He squatted on a rock, troubling no one, seeking no help. While by hiring old Robert Stewart's slaves, he built a stone house on the rock. Then, in the handfuls of earth, wherever a root would hold, he started to plant the mountain with peach trees. Then the beginning of the end began to start. Hey, Mozart, who is there to be here, huh? You're new in town. So? The lady behind the bar is the owner, a widow lady. Her name is Mrs. Cambridge. That's all right, Abner. Here's your beer, Vaccaro. Ah, muchas gracias, la dama Cambridge. Senora, won't you? I do not want to make enemies. I am looking for a friend. It's a friendly town. Who? She is an old amigo de la guerra. A big man with a black beard. Big, like so. And this strange accent, I think maybe his real name is uh, Doomdorf, like that. Doomdorf? Uh, Mary, I... What is this? We are old camaradas. I just want to find him to settle an old debt I owe him. Uh, well, why don't I let him know you're here and you can meet him in town? 
If you will, it is no matter. But why not I just go see him? Uh, he's kind of queer-like. Uh, like he don't take the mixing so good. <laughs> no, no, importante. You see him, you tell him Jose Garcia was look for him. But uh, I have not so much time. Maybe on my way back, I look him up then. Hasta la vista. I'll see you. <laughs> why didn't you tell him where to find Doomdorf? Uh, just a crazy notion, maybe, but I got it set in my mind that he wanted to see him to put a bullet in him. We found the man who said his name was Jose Garcia snagged on a rock at the devil's elbow two to three miles below Doomdorf's mountain iry. His neck was broken. That was the first of the Doomdorf incidents. So many during the next ten years, I wouldn't wear your patience to recount them. Only the highlights. There was the night before we knew what use Doomdorf was putting his peach crop to when he arrived at Mrs. Cambridge's Inn, primed with liquor, an insensate beast. Ah, uh, ten dollars. <laughs> Not enough. So, fifteen, twenty. I think you've had enough to drink, Mr. Doomdorf. I must ask you to leave. What? A prostitute who runs a cantina asked me to leave. The lady asked you to ride out, mister. Better you go easy. By yourself. You mean I don't go? You make me. Yeah, no cause for any eruptions. You've been drinking. Oh, so you want to make trouble? Not me. I just want to keep the peace. And stop. Hey, twenty-five. Okay, that does it. Abner, no. Too late. We fight now, huh? Outside. I don't want to fight. What for? You fight me here or outside. One way or other. They were two big men, but Abner was a peaceful man and sought only to protect himself, while Doomdorf was a maniac. He gouged, butted, kneed, and finally it took six of us to pull him off and lodge him in the jail for the night. Abner took it in a stride, as he did everything. He was battered and bruised, and just maybe, if he'd used his whole strength, he could have broken Doomdorf. But Abner's strength was in the mind as well as in his bulk. The next highlight in the career of the man whose name spelled his future was the arrival of the circuit rider. The days of Sodom and Gomorrah are upon us. Here's a man who takes the fruit of his field and makes a white liquid fury to destroy men's lives and their souls and who is ready to bring out your daughters and your women like Lot for the use of any eternal seance. The town was not yet ready to make any move against Doomdorf. His still was popular. He made a fair brand of white lightning until the ultimate, the unforgivable, the certain shame all those of us who knew or at least sensed the truth brought everything to a head. On a wild, rainy night, while Doc Jeffers and I were playing chess at his house, there came a hammering at the door. Yeah. Let me hear. Ah, Doomdorf, come on in. Well, what is it? The woman. She was in labor. I tried to bring Bambino. No good. You come? Yes, of course. Of course, I'll get a poncho and saddle my horse. I waited all night for Doc Jeffers to return. It was long past sunrise, with the rain still coming down that he did. Well? Uh, I am a pragmatic man, and I subscribe to no religion, but by damn, I... I wish this moment I had a God to pray to. Why? He left that child to abort a dead baby. It's a miracle she isn't shot in septicemia. Uh, he, he didn't want a baby. I'm a judge now, Ray. Maybe I can help. Uh, no, no one can help. He's a beast, unprincipled and without pity or even a uh, simple human warmth. But he has papers to protect him. The girl was Mexican-born, literally, uh, literally sold into slavery, and she's... Oh, my Lord, she can't be any older than my teenage daughter, but she's his to do with as he wants. And as he wants, 
Oh, he damn near succeeded in killing her. Excuse me. Hmm? Well, hello, Sheriff Abner. New star looks good on you. Uh, seems I'm going to have a use for it. Right away. How? Oh. My deputy, Ben James, just rode in here hell for leather. After the doc here left Doomdorf, seems the preacher came by, headed for the devil's hump, preaching fire and carrying his gun. Looks like all hell is finally ready to break loose up there. All hell break loose. All right. But for whom? For poor little... Now, there's a sad thing. Poor little who? We don't even know her name. If she has one. Or has retribution caught up with Doomdorf? And if so, how? And why? And where? I'll return shortly with Act Two. It was a long ride out to the Devil's Hump, and the afternoon sun was burning hot and steaming above the great chestnut trees that shaded the trail. A trail so narrow, the judge's horse had to follow behind Abner's. Abner had his Winchester out of the holster across his saddle. Whatever hell had broken loose, he was ready for it. And now I'll turn the story back to Judge Randolph. He can tell it better. He was there. I suppose seeing Abner, I should have had my own rifle out. But I'm an indifferent shot. And Abner, for all he loathes violence, can part a twig at a hundred yards. I reckon there ain't no sense to push the horses up that rock trail, Judge. We'll dismount here and climb up the rest by foot. Seems quiet enough up there. I don't know. Look at them vultures up there. You know, when they start wheeling, there's only one good reason. Well, maybe we should have brought some men. No, I doubt it. It appears to me whatever hell broke loose is pure gone and burned itself out. We had made a detour through a grove of peach trees before we set the horses out to graze, but now we were climbing in the open under the burning sun. When I saw that gaunt old circuit rider, Bronson, sitting bareheaded, Hands on the pommel of his saddle, in a paved court before the door. His big red horse was dripping with sweat. I braced myself for anything. He seemed in a kind of trance. Bronson? Where's Doomdor? Surely he covers his feet in his summer chamber. Now look here, Bronson. No, leave him be. He's in his own world, not ours. Come on, Judge. Howdy, Mrs. Doomdorf. Uh, si, senor. It's Sheriff Abner Dale, and I'm Judge Randolph. Uh, where is Mr. Doomdorf? Oh, senor, he went to lie down in his south room upstairs after the midday meal. Uh, was he feeling all right? Oh, yes. That is what he does every day. It is his custom. Ah, uh, so. Uh, did you send Ben James for us? Send for you? Oh, no, senor. But uh, come in. I, I will take you upstairs. I'm glad you are here. Uh, why, ma'am? Well, I was in the orchard to gather some fruit if it was ripe, but when I came back... He... Shh, shh, shh. This is his door. I, I, I cannot wake him. Uh-huh. Uh, can you open the door? Oh, no. Uh, why? Why, are you afraid to? I could not. It is bolted. Does he always bolt it? When it... Goes to lie down, yes. Or whenever he sleeps, anywhere. Why, because he's afraid of something? Oh, yes. Who? Those men. What men? The ones he stole from, that he fought with in Mexico for the revolution. And then he he ran away. Leaving them to die? I think. Hmm. Not all. They still come after him. But he is too careful. Here, he cannot be surprised. Yeah. Maybe just for once he wasn't so careful, and they did. Knock on the door, Abner. Sure thing. Doomdorf! Doomdorf, wake up! You're in there! Let me, let me. Doomdorf! 
It's all right. This is Judge Randolph. Doomdorf, come out. If he could come out, he would. I do not think he can come out. Any other doors to this room? No. Windows? The casa, the house is built on the cliff. No way in from the outside. All right, Abner. Let's break it down. Uh, Stand back, Judge. I'll get it. Uh, This time. Keep back uh, until I make sure the coast is clear. Doomdorf. Doomdorf, are you... What is it? Oh, he is dead. I'm afraid so. Oh, oh, then at last, I have killed him. I have killed him. I have killed him. I'd better go after her. No need. <laughs> Where can she go? No, we'd better look at him first. I'll close the door. He's been shot. Yeah. Pretty near ripped him in half. Look at the size of that hole in his waistcoat. Smells like burnt powder in here. You sure we're alone? (laughs) See for yourself, Judge. Nothing in the room but some chairs, couch he's lying on, and that table with a bottle on it. No doors. Window shutters thrown back, but the window's closed. (laughs) Well, at least we know he wasn't shot from outside. It kind of looks that way. You sure he's dead? He, he's cold in the mackerel. Even the sun coming in couldn't keep him warm. Where's the weapon? Well, right behind you, I'd say. On them two dogwood forks on the wall. Those would be made to rest it on. The shotgun, yes. It's been fired quite recently. There's a freshly exploded cap right under the hammer. Yeah, I saw that. Hmm, he'd been drinking some. Hmm, Heavy, I'd say. You think it's suicide? I don't hardly think after he got a whole blow that size in him that he'd get up and hang up that gun nice and neat. No, I don't hardly think so neither, Abner. This is murder. The woman took that gun down and shot Doomdorf while he was sleeping on that couch. Could be, I suppose. But what about Bronson? He came in here breathing death and destruction. Oh, he's just a mad old circuit preacher. Who's been preaching a crusade far and wide through the hills against Doomdorf for furnishing this here moonshine. We have a murder on our hands. And you think the woman is guilty? Well, what else? Well, let's go ask Bronson first who killed him. But by the time we got to the outer courtyard, the old man had disappeared, although his red horse stood tethered to a rail. I hesitated for a moment or two, turning the strange and tragic event that had taken place over and over in my mind. Come with me, Judge, around the other side of the house, huh? Very well. Yeah, but stay behind me for cover. Cover from what? Who knows? There's a murder around here somewhere. Well, the woman has already confessed. I think she's not quite right in the head after all she's gone through. Hey, hold it. What? The back of the house. Flush with the edge of the cliff. Over a hundred foot drop to the river. Judge, Doomdorf was a soldier, all right. Well, how do you reckon that for certain? Any good general first makes sure his rear is protected. And he couldn't be flanked. The only way to flush Doomdorf out was up that goat path we climbed to the house. He he knew what he was doing when he made this his castle. Yes, Abner. I recognized that years ago when that man who called himself Garcia came looking for him. I'm sure there were others who came after all that gold he brought strapped in his money belt. Only one difference with them. Or maybe two. What? They didn't ask questions. We never found their bodies. I suppose you're right. I hold no brief for Doomdorf. The man reeked of evil. But the fact is, as officers of the law, we do have a body. And there are things to be done. Right enough. For the sun is getting low in the sky. You expect me to arrest the woman? Well, at least we must question her. Come. We should question Bronson, too. Why? It's a notion I got. Just to make it all neat and tidy. Yeah, there he is now. Bronson? I cannot tarry, brother. I am about the Lord's work. 
Where are you going? To that damnable still. With this axe and in the name of him who is my shield and my strength, I shall destroy the evil work that immoral Doomdorf has wrought. Bronson? What? Who killed Doomdorf? Why do you have to ask? I killed him. I cut him down in the prime of his sin. By the almighty. What is this, Abner? Everybody couldn't have killed him. Who can tell how many had a hand in it? Are you deliberately trying to mystify me? The thing is impossible. The impossible here looks like the truth. Come with me, Judge, and I will show you a thing more impossible than all. I followed Abner back into the house and up the stair again up to the room. The door swung open, the shattered edge of it with a lock hanging half out, and Abner closed it carefully behind us after we entered. I want to show you something, Judge. The bolt that kept the door closed. Yes, sir. But I want you to see that it is no way connected with the lock itself. See? And it is on the inside. Now, how could the one who killed Doomdorf get into the room when we know the door was bolted and we had to break it down to enter? Only one other way. Through the windows. Well, let's look at them. Now, remember, we have seen from the outside that there is a sheer drop of at least 100 feet to the river, and the rock is as smooth as glass. Now, try try looking out. Oh, just as you said, the wall of the house is plumb with a rock face. Yeah, that is not. You can't open these windows. See? Examine the frames. They're cemented into their casement with dust, and, and they're bound along the edges with cobwebs. That's right. These windows have never been opened. Yeah. Then how did the assassin enter? Well, he, uh... Of course. The answer is evident. Whoever killed Doomdorf hid in the room till he was asleep. Then he shot him and went out. Where could he hide? And even supposing he could, when he left, how did the assassin bolt the door behind him? When the bolt was on the inside of the door. Then who knows... Maybe Doomdorf did kill himself. No, we ruled that out yesterday. Then there's only one open road out of the mystery. Both the woman and Bronson claim they killed Doomdorf. Let us go down and ask them. Question. No. In the law court, that procedure could be considered sound sense. But, Judge, we are in God's court. And things are done in a somewhat stranger way. In what way do you mean... In a way that still must be put to the proof. And for that, we need to borrow time. But I have every faith that time will show us exactly who murdered, or perhaps the better word might be, executed the man who lies dead before us. I said in the beginning, a story to terrify and... Tantalize, and tantalizing it must be. A man, alive and alone by himself in a locked room, has met death by the blast of a shotgun, neatly returned to its place on the wall. By whose hand? In what way? These are the questions, and others, to be answered when I return shortly with Act Three. the dead man, Judge Randolph faces Sheriff Abner Dale, a frown of puzzlement on his patrician face. His eyes search the expression of the great lumbering young man in front of him, whose whole physical appearance suggests a man of action rather than one of thought or mental ability. The judge is the first to break the silence posed by the seemingly insoluble problem they face. What do you mean we are in God's court? And things are done in a somewhat stranger way. Before we go question those who are so anxious to be convicted of the assassination of Doomdorf, let us find out, if we can, at what hour he actually died. How? I seem to remember he wore a watch. Ah, yeah, here it is in the waistcoat pocket, broken by the shot. At what hour stand the hands? Just past one o'clock. 
By the look of Bronson, when we found him here, he must have been far off, still on his way to this place. And the woman, by her story, was down the mountains picking fruit among the peach trees. That's how I had it figured. Well, why waste time on speculation anymore? We know who did this thing. Let us go down and get the story of it out of their own mouths. Either Bronson or the woman killed the man. I could better believe it, but for the inevitability of a certain awful law. All they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Oh, the good book. Matthew. We reap what we sow. Thus, we receive what we give and nothing else. That is God's law. Very well, in a sense. But in this case... Yeah. By all means, let us go try the method of your law courts. Your faith lies in the wisdom of their ways. We came down the stairs together, Abner, calm and reflective. Myself, tortured and mystified. Bronson, how did you kill Doomdorf? I killed him as the liars killed the captains of Isaiah in their fifties. But not by the hand of any man did I pray the Lord God to destroy him with the fire from heaven. I prayed him to destroy Doomdorf. Give me the axe in your hand. So, now, explain yourself. His hands were red with blood. The widow and the orphan cried to heaven against him. I will surely hear their cry as the promise written in the book. And you were the instrument raised up to heed their cry. Yes, and the land was weary of him. And I prayed the Lord God to destroy him with fire from heaven as he destroyed the princes of Gomorrah in their palaces. With fire from heaven? Come, Abner. We waste our time here. A moment. Bronson. Bronson, do you hear me? I hear you, Abner and Gale. A little while ago, when we came, I asked you where Doomdorf was. And you answered me in the third chapter of the book of Judges. Why did you answer me like that? When I said, surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber? Yeah. The woman told me he had not come down from the chamber where he had gone up to sleep. It was then I knew that he was dead in his summer chamber like Eglon, king of Moab. How could you know? Why, look you off there to the south. I came here from the Great Valley to, to cut down these groves of Baal and to empty out the stinking abomination. But I did not know... That the Lord has heard my prayer and visited his wrath on Doomdorf until I was come up the mountain to his door. But when the woman spoke, I knew it. My work here is done. I must ride where the Lord calls me. Just a minute. Why stop him? You're right. You're right. That was only a waste of time. Bronson did not kill Doomdorf. But do you realize, Judge, how he did die? <laughs> At least not by Bronson. And not by fire from heaven. Doomdorf was dead before Bronson got here with his fire-breathing scripture. The woman must be the guilty one. Night had entered the valley with the setting of the sun. And there were other things to do before the inquisition of the woman. By candlelight, the shadows weird and fearsome on the wall, we made a coffin. We put Doomdorf in it, straightened out his limbs and folded his arms across his shot-out heart, and we set the coffin on benches in the hall. Then we kindled a fire in the living room where the woman had put some meat and golden cheese and a loaf on the table. You have eaten enough? As much as is fitting. I will leave it as it is, in case you should want more. I am going now. Where? To the sea. And the ship... He is dead. And I am free. Not quite. There is a question still to be settled. Who killed your... Who killed Doomdorf? But I have told you. I killed him. It was fair. Fair? Oh, I, I, I remember an old... Old man sitting against a sunny wall. And a little girl... Who plucked yellow flowers from the grass... And put them in her hair... She laughed and she was happy because she was 12 years old. And in a few days she would be 13 and she would make her novena. But they were bad times and the big stranger with the black beard and the hard hands came to the old man 
and talked. And after he had talked a long time, he, he gave the old man a, a gold chain and some money. And he took the little girl away. He used her in a way she did not know. And if she tried to run away or keep him away, <laughs> you like to look at the scars on my back? You want to ask the doctor who was too late to save my baby? Oh, it was fair to kill him. But where will he go? Mi abuelo will be gone by now. My, my grandfather was dying ten years ago, but the wall will still be there. And maybe the sun and the yellow flowers. It, it is all right that I go? Mm. It's up to the judge. I cannot find it in my heart to hold you, or in the law. There's not a jury in Virginia who would convict you for shooting a beast like that. I thank you, Judge, but I, I have not shoot him. Not shoot him? Well, the man is riddled. Oh, yes, senor. I kill him, but I have not shoot him. I, I kill him with, with which words I have remembered from my mother. You can't kill a man with words, ma'am. Oh, I know, senor. That is why I I make a doll in wax. And I put a needle through his breast. And he died very quickly. Now, senor, I may go. It was good that you let her go, Judge. No, it was pathetic. A harmless little dream to rid herself of a monster... With an enchanted straw man. I think she had money in her saddlebag, but I slipped some extra just in case. And now, where are we? Waiting, like her, for the dawn. This is the strangest thing that ever happened. Someone shot the man, but who? And how did the killer get out of that shut-up room? For that matter, how did he get in? Through the window. Through the window? You yourself have showed me that was impossible. You proved it could never have been opened. I did. It never was opened. Abner, what are you trying to tell me? How Doomdorf died. You're trying to say that the one who killed him climbed that sheer wall, got in through a closed window, without even disturbing a crumb of dust or breaking a cobweb? I'm telling you, the murderer of Doomdorf did even more. What? We must wait for tomorrow, when the assassin returns. Then I'll show you who killed Doomdorf and how. I could have argued, but I knew that set look on Abner's face too well to waste my time. I could not have believed that I could sleep with the thoughts spinning in my brain. But I did. We ate, and through the morning dug a grave for the dead man in silence. By the time the last spadeful of earth was thrown back, it was high noon, and Abner squinted up at the sun. <clears throat> time to throw our spades down and go lay an ambush for the assassin. He's already on the way here, Judge. Where do we go? Back to the house, and up to Doomdorf's room. We must make certain preparations. What are you doing? I'm loading the shotgun, as it was before it took Doomsdorf's life. And now I place it back on its rack, exactly as I found it. What do you want to do with this pillow and his coat? The blood is not entirely dry. Here, give them to me. We'll wrap the coat around the pillow as if it were a body. And place it here on the couch, just where Doomdorf lay. Now, look out the window. Is the day still clear? Not a cloud in the sky. Huh. Just like yesterday. If not hotter. Now, for the moonshine. Or this bottle of still liquor. Let's see. Good. You can see by the dust ring on the table that it sets just where it did yesterday as I return it to its resting place. Whatever you say, but, but I, I still don't see how... Why? Why? Shh. We are about to trick the murderer in the act. 
But we came without guns. How can we protect ourselves? We need no protection, Judge. It is all in the hands of the Lord. Look, the assassin is creeping along the wall. Where? Shh, look, that point of light. I followed the line of his extended finger and saw what he meant. A tiny disk of focused white-hot sunlight moving slowly across the wall toward the shotgun. He that taketh the sword shall perish by the sword. The water bottle, full of doomed dwarf's liquor, is focusing the sun to the heat of a lighted match as it travels to the lock and firing pin of the shotgun. The answer to Bronson's prayer, the fire from heaven. Now, watch it. Now. As the pinpoint of sunlight reached the percussion cap, the gun exploded as though the trigger had been pulled. The pillow, wrapped in the dead man's coat, lying on the couch where the man himself had lain some 24 hours before, leaped and shuddered like a living thing and collapsed inertly. The room was still echoing with the sound of the explosion. My own voice sounded cramped and hoarse as I said, And we mistrust coincidence. Why, it is a world filled with the joinder of accidents. It is a world filled with the mysterious justice of God. The answer to the mystery of the Doomdorf murder. A fate well deserved. And brought only on himself by the dead man who had little right or reason to live. Wouldn't it be nice if an equal fate could be the lot of so many people each of us know? Except, uh, who are we to be the judge? That belongs, thank God, to the higher power I inadvertently named. I'll be back shortly. It seems to me necessary, in conclusion, to put a quote used in this story in its exact context. When Jesus had been betrayed by Judas, and when the high priest's men came to take him by force, one of those with him struck out against the attackers, wounding him. It was then that Jesus spoke the full quote, saying, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take up the sword shall perish with the sword. As you see, it was still, and always, the Prince of Peace who spoke. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Fred Gwynn, Bryna Rayburn, Ian Martin, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs>